Come on, let's give God a great hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. 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 How many are ready to learn about God today? Everybody in the building, amen. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here today. Amen. I want to encourage you uh, coming up um, on this Thursday. Of course, Eddie James will be here in concert. Let's give God a hand for that. It's a free concert. Please bring your friends, family. It'll be a wonderful event. Thank you. And uh, it's going to be an amazing event. And then on Friday night, we'll have a, a marriage conference, uh, one of our first marriage conferences of this year. It's going to be amazing, and we're going to have uh, incredible singers before we begin into the, to the, to the uh, conference. Uh, so be here early. Make sure you get your seats. Um, it is televised. We are going to have it live streaming, and we have it on the radio. So make sure you're here in advance. Amen? Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready to learn. Amen. We are going to continue in our series of Kingdom Matters. Kingdom Matters. It is a series that will change the way that we see life. It is a series that will change the way we look at God and those things that are around us. So I want you to get ready. Uh, get your pen and paper out. We are going to be studying about God. Who is God? What is, what is he? Where is he from? Who, who made him? I mean, is he, is he made or was he before things that were made? What is all this stuff about God? Do I pray to God? Do I pray to Jesus? Do I pray to the Holy Spirit? Which one do I talk to? Do I talk to them all? Do I say, hey, y'all, because I'm from the South? What do you do? You know, you got to know which one to pray. How many think you ought to pray to God the Father only? How many, pray, how many would do that? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Go ahead. This is, I'm scared to raise my hand, and this is, I'm absolutely certain. Okay, how many think you need to pray to God the Father only? Raise your hand. All right. How about to Jesus? How about to the Holy Spirit? How many have no clue? How many just don't know which one? You didn't even think about the question before. Okay, here we go again. Now, I want you to know, I can see everybody in the building. So if you don't raise your hand, I'm looking at you. Okay, how many believe that we ought to pray to God? That's who we pray to. Okay, put your hands down. How many believe we ought to pray to Jesus? Raise your hand. How many believe we ought to pray to the Holy Spirit? Okay. How many say we pray to everybody? <laughs> so y'all do those y'all prayers, huh? All right. Well, here's the thing. What, when we talk about God, when we talk about him, who is he? We need to discover who he is because it's very important what we learn about him defines who we are. Now, when we think about God, the first thing we've got to know uh, is what is God? What is God? Uh, write it down. What is God? What is, what is God? What is God? God. Uh, here's a question that's good to know. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter uh, 4, verse 23. We're going to find out what is God. What, what is God? We're going to find this out. What is he? John chapter 4, verse 23. Okay. All right, let's all read verse 23 and then we're going to 24. Let's read. All right, we must worship him where? In spirit and truth. So the way that you can truly worship God is in your spirit. You, you have to worship him with your spirit, man. That means on the inside, not what we do on the outside, not all those things on the outside, but from within. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must be honest with God because he sees everything anyway. Hello, somebody. Amen. So we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, for the father seeketh such to worship him. But let's read the next verse and find out what God is. Let's read verse 24. God 
He repeats himself. Why must we worship in the spirit? Because why? God is a spirit. Now, here's the question. What does the spirit look like? Does, is, is God like fluffy like a cloud? Does he have wings? What does he look like? Is he like a big bright light in which we all go back into? What does he look like? What does God look like? Is he, is he un, unseen? Can you, can you not know him? Uh, uh, can, you, can you see God? Where, where, where is he? Well, well, let's start with one question, where he is. I want you to go to Isaiah 66 and 1. And let's look there for a second. Where is God? Where is God? He's in Isaiah 66 and 1. And let's see what it says. Isaiah 66 and 1. Amen. We're getting there. Amen. Chapter 66. There we go. Watch this. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my and the earth. You mean it, it, the earth is just big enough for his foot. Hello, somebody. Heaven is his throne room. He sits in heaven. He says, where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? Look at verse 2. Watch this. For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things that have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit that trembleth after my word. He says, listen, I don't need you to build me anything here. Because I made everything you got. I'm looking for a person whose heart, look at what it says, who is a poor of spirit and contrite in spirit. Meaning when you're poor in spirit, it means you need him in order to be rich in spirit. You need him. You're willing to submit to him. He said, you know what I want? I don't want money. I don't want gold. I made all that stuff. But I want a spirit that worships me in spirit and in truth. You know, I, it's so funny. I remember um, <clears throat> a story about some scientists that uh, made a, a, a deal with God. They said, you know what, God? You know, uh, we, we, we've advanced over the years, and we think we can do what you do. And God said, oh, really? He says, yeah. We think we can create life, too. He goes, oh, you can create life, huh? Yeah, yeah, we can do it. He says, deal. Let's go ahead and see who can do it better. He says, okay, all right. The scientist said, okay, we're going to do this. He says, all right, get, 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 uh, 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 get some dirt and, 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 and let's start. And God said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh-uh, get your own dirt. <laughs> Only God can create life, but his home is in heaven, so he's not bound by anything here. He can't be impressed by things on earth. Somebody ought to be glad about that. Because when, 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 when it comes down to having the nicest things on earth, that don't mean anything to God. He's not looking on the outward appearance of a man. God looks at a man's heart. God is looking for a spirit to worship him in truth. Someone that will stand up to injustice. Someone that will stand up to unrighteousness. Right now, in our country, we have a president that will lie. Okay, do we say that or are we so scared that we'll get, mad, get the Republicans mad or the Democrats mad that we won't stand in righteousness and say, a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. Well, you're Republican or Democrat. I'm Christian. I'm above all that. I have to look at what is truth because if I can't teach my kids that's not how you act, then I'm not worth my salt. Doesn't matter what president is in office, what congressman is in office. It doesn't matter who's in office. Are you living righteously or unrighteously? Are you living in spirit and in truth? Ladies and gentlemen, will you stand up for what is right and not be intimidated by politics or intimidated by what's socially correct, but be able to say before God, I live because you said truth is how I should live, and I live by that standard. God is a spirit, and he seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. But if we were to understand God, we must ask the question, who is God? Who is God? And there's a definitive answer. I want you to go to 1 John 
chapter 4, verse, starting at verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. And it says, Beloved, this is John the apostle speaking to the congregation there. He makes this statement to the people and he says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. Listen to me. You can't have hatred in your heart and claim to know God. Listen to me. We are such a country divided by color and race and economics and so many things. And we compare each other among each other and we miss God completely because we don't realize that God doesn't look at those comparisons. He says, he that compares themselves among themselves is not wise. God is not looking at that. The next verse tells us who God is. Watch this in the next verse and let's read it together. Verse eight, watch this. He that loveth not Knoweth not God for God is love. What is he? Love. What is God? Love. Listen, it doesn't say God has love. I need you to capture this thought. He doesn't have love. He is love. So you know those times when you feel like God's against me or maybe God, why God is letting this happen to me? Listen, God ain't the one to blame. There's an enemy that walks this world that tries to seek to kill, steal, and destroy. God is love. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants you to succeed. God wants you to be better. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God so loved. My God, it ain't the kind of love that's called eros in the Greek. It's not out of passion because passion will come and it will go. It's not phileo, meaning I'm friendship. We just like each other, love the way you dress. Uh Uh-uh, it's agape love. It means I give it to you whether you give it back to me at all. How many are glad that God loves us like that? We need people in our lives that will love us in agape style because when you are loved by an agape God, that means you can mess up today, get back up on your feet and keep walking because his heart hasn't changed towards you. Look at your neighbor and say, you are more important than your sins. Look at the other side and say, you are more important than your faults. See, God wants you to get up Get going. Get back with God. It doesn't matter how long you've been away. Come on back home. God is love. My goodness. Man, why do you think healings happen? Because love says, I don't like the fact you're hurting. Love says, I don't like the fact that you're going through. God is love. Why would he chase after you? Why would he come after you? Why would he seek you out? Why would he put you in a people that will love you who you don't even know? Because God is. He doesn't have it. It's not like on Saturday it was a good day, but on Sunday he had a bad day. No, he is God all the time. He loves you See, sometimes we beat ourselves up so bad that we begin to project on God. Well, maybe God don't love me. Maybe because how I feel about myself. Maybe my daddy didn't treat me right. My mama didn't treat me right. Maybe he's like that. Hold on. Wait a minute. The very best father came from him. The very best father in the world was an offspring of him. He's the best daddy we'll ever get. Come on, somebody. He says he's a father to the fatherless. And a... 
he will take us up. That is your daddy. That's why we sing the song, Abba. It means in the Greek, daddy. Yeah. Intimate relationship. Man, how, listen, my daddy in the natural may not have been all that he could have been, but I got a daddy in the supernatural that has always been the same. God is love. And I need you to understand, I, I need to go somewhere right here. I need to sh shift. Because if you understood God, how much he loves you, on, you can never, ever compare yourself to another person again. I need you to hear me now. I need you to poke your neighbor and say, don't you dare sleep on me right now. <laughs> Open your eyes and listen to me. <laughs> Not your ears, your eyes. Amen. I want to share something with you. If we go back to Genesis chapter 2, something unique happened. Something so unique, it changed everything. When I was traveling to Cleveland, I was going to the Bishop's College as we get ready for the elevation service, and we'll explain more why that's going to be critical to our church. But while I was there, he taught me something about myself. Has anybody ever felt like you weren't worthy? Can the rest of us tell the truth too? <laughs> How many of us have ever felt like we weren't worthy? I know. And we struggle with that every day. You can, ladies can turn on the television and see these women on television, housewives of Cleveland, Orlando, <laughs> Leesburg, Wildwood, come on. The housewives of everywhere. And they got all these things, and we go, well, I don't have that. Maybe something's wrong with me. Or we turn on, and we see these muscle-bound guys, and we think all the muscle-bound guys look the same, and I'm not that, so I can, maybe I'll never be. Or we see people with nice families, and we think, well, man, what about me? I don't have that. Therefore, I'm missing something. Let me tell you something. If you've got breath in your body, you got everything you need. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you listen, I'm going to show you through the word, the breath in your body is the fact that God loves you. The very breath in your body signifies you belong to a greater family. The Good God Almighty. Ah, let me help you with somebody. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to teach you who God is. I'm going to show you God. How many want to see God? Come on. How many want to see God? Okay, the Bible says if you see God, you die. How many want to see God? Okay. That is in the Bible. Somebody call the ambulance. We got some folk dropping. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 2. I need you to see something about yourself. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 5. This is so important. This is a game changer right here. A game changer. Because some of us in this room are so busy beating ourselves up because we think we lack value. And when you feel like you lack value, you usually settle. You think you got no credit? You'll usually take whatever car they give you. If you think you don't have spiritual value, you'll usually marry whoever comes along. I need to show you your value. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Watch this. This is what God said. And every plant of the field, this is the beginning when he's making everything, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. He had made everything, the earth was there, but it never rained. It never rained. In Genesis, it never rained until Noah. 
Everything was waiting for a moment to happen. There was no man to till the ground. There could be no trees without someone to till the ground. Look at verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. What is man made out of? The dust of the earth. Has anybody ever tried to shake dust? Raise your hand if you have. You have? Thank you so much, daughter. It's very hard to do. It's like, <clears throat> so God couldn't shake that. What did he do? He caused the mist to rest upon the dust. Then he was able to shape it into the form of a man. No rain, a mist. See, God had to shape us, so he had to create something that's never been seen before in order that we could be. God will create things in this world just so that you could exist. You can survive. You can be shaped. But watch this. And he watered the whole face of the ground, verse 7. And then the Lord was able to do this. Everyone read. And the Lord God Hold on a second. This is life-changing. God shaped him out of the earth. But that was just a statue. He breathed into him the breath of life. Everybody, I want you to take a deep breath. Then let it out. Do it again. Let it out. Let me tell you something. That breath you let out, you'll never get back. Every time you breathe out, that breath, you'll never get back. That breath was so unique that you'll never have that breath again. Watch what God does. God breathes into man a breath. Unlike every other breath he's ever breathed, and man became a living soul. <sighs> that breath will never come back again. That breath will always be Adam. That breath, there's not another Adam like him. Nobody can be created like him. That breath from God is unique. The Bible says that in the heavenly throne, the seraphims fly, crone around, crying, holy, holy, holy. And one man who went to heaven said he, when he looked and saw the seraphims flying around the throne of God, crying, holy, holy, holy. He said, why do they keep doing this from eternity to eternity? And the angel said to him, because every time they go around God, they see an aspect of God they've never seen before. Therefore, they cry, holy. Holy, holy. But ladies and gentlemen, let me make it come home to you. Everybody in here is a breath of God. There's not another one like you. Holy, holy, holy. I can look around this room and see aspects of God that I have never seen It ain't just your fingerprints, it's your life. You are so unique, you can't, you better not, double dog dare you, try yourself and compare yourself to somebody else's breath. You can't do it. You are unique. You are so unique that when God, you into existence, there's not another breath of God like that. Look at your neighbor and say, you're unique. Look at your neighbor and say, there's not another one like you. Hallelujah. Let me show you something. 
This is why the Bible says that we must be conformed into his image. Because we've been trained by the devil to doubt God. We've been trained by the enemy to be blinded to who he is. But we are him. We are his aspects. I am God in the earth. He breathed me. We are sons and daughters of the king. Oh, y'all ain't got it yet. Hold on now. Mm. That breath you breathe out will never come back again because it's so unique. And when God made you, he's, there's not another person that has your skills, your abilities, your outlook. Why? Because you're an aspect of God that he wanted to glorify in the earth. He, now watch this now. You're just this generation. Every time he breathed, from the beginning of time, he spit out another unique aspect of himself. Every time in this generation, he breathed you out. You were a different aspect of God that he breathed out that ain't anywhere else in the entire world. And I like to think that there's over 2.5 billion believers on the planet and still he's spitting them out. Come on, somebody. Now, what does that mean for your life? If how then can you know who you are? Let me explain something. Destiny is not a place or a position. Destiny is a person. We think, I want to fulfill my purpose and destiny, and we keep thinking about a position or a, 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 a place in life. And God said, you done missed it. Your destiny is to be conformed into the image of his son. Why? Because when you are conformed into him, you discover more about who you are. You're his breath. Watch this. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 29 through 32. We want to find out, God, what's my purpose? What's my destiny? What, what am I supposed to do? Who am I? Listen, the best way for you to discover who you are is to discover who he is. Because you're his breath. And the more you get closer to him, the more all that stuff you were trained to, to disbelieve God falls off. And you become that perfect aspect of God in the earth. You begin to think like him, talk like him, walk like him, act like him. Jesus says, you shall do greater works than I will because I'm going to the Father. I've done my job. Now it's your turn. Watch this, Romans chapter 8. He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be what? To be what? Hold on. You mean to tell me that God, before you even hit the planet, before you even hit the body you're in now, predestined you to do one thing. Everybody put up a finger. One thing. Ain't but one thing you got to do, and that is to be conformed. Woo! Conformed into the image of his son. What does that mean? That means your gifts and talents, your abilities become perfected the more you look like him. <laughs> the more you sit with God, the more all those gifts you got start to make sense. Well, man, this is an aspect of God. He wanted an earth. He wanted a doctor. He wanted a nurse. He wanted a teacher. He wanted a mother. He wanted a father. He wanted this person, that person with these skills. All that comes from him. And the more you know him, the better at who you are you become. Amen. God, though. Watch this. He also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. Good God Almighty, I'm here to give you the good news 
that God wants to glorify your life. You trying to hide in the background and God's trying to put you out in the forefront. He says, can you light a candle and put it under a bushel? Can you put a city on a hill? Shall it be hid? I made you to glorify my name. I made you to look like me, talk like me, act like me, to be that aspect of me in the earth. Don't run from me. Come to me. Watch this. Verse 31. 31. Not one. Here we go. What shall we then say to these things, ladies and gentlemen? Good God Almighty. You mean to tell me because you're breathing in this earth? Who can be against you if you are God's aspect in this earth? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about God the Father, but I need you to understand his greatest goal was for you to be like him. You may have an occupation in this earth and you have God separate. And that's where the mistake is made. You've got to understand God is over your occupation. He's over your marriage. He's over everything that you have in your life. And the more you become like him, the better you get at your marriage, the better you get at your job, the better you get as a person. God wants you to be conformed into the image of his son so that you can be the firstborn of many brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, today to learn about God is to learn about yourself. How many in here want to see God? Then I want, I want to give you a clue. I want to show you. All right? Get ready. I want to show you God. Look right up there. Put your finger and point right up there. You see it? Then I want you to do this. That's God. That's why we have to love one another. How can you love a God you cannot see? How can you hate your brother whom you see and say you love a God you cannot see? If these are the aspects of God, he says what you do to the least of these, you do to me. Because everybody sitting around you is an aspect of God you ain't never seen before. So it ain't the color of their skin. It's the fact that God glorified himself in that body. He glorified himself in that person, in that race, in that culture. God's glorifying himself. He said, my glory will fill the earth. I need you to look at somebody next to you and say, man, God looks good to me. Come on now. Come on. Come on. That's why you can't hold a grudge against God. Come on, somebody. You can't be angry against God. That's the neighbor. When you cut a hold of that, then you'll go after people who don't know who they are because you realize they don't know who they are in God. And all you want to do is get them to know him because if they could discover who they are in Christ, woo woo Man, they can love their enemies. Why? Because there ain't no enemy. There are fallen aspects of God that need to be reconnected to their daddy. Come on, somebody. There, there are sons that are missing their father figures. There are daughters that are missing their father figure. It's because they got to get reconnected to God. That's why you are here today to learn who you are so you can get reconnected to your daddy. Come on, stand to your feet. As we are talking kingdom matters, I want to say to you today, don't compare yourself to another person ever again. No matter how you look at yourself, that ain't how God sees you. He made you just like him. He made you to be you. And he's proud of what he does. Our job is to become more like Jesus so we can shake off those things that aren't like him. I'll close with this last verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. 
and I want you, somebody hit the doorbell. Um, I'm going to just play. Romans chapter 12. Start in verse 1. Watch this. I beseech you, frontarians, sisters, brothers, guests, members, those who are here for the first time, visitors, I beseech you by the mercies of God that today, after hearing this message, would you present your body finally to be used for the right reasons, finally to be used for the purpose of God as a living sacrifice. God doesn't want you dead. He wants you living and living right, living for him, holy and acceptable unto God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the least you can do. Look at verse 2. It's still playing some music. But watch this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? That means you already have it. You just must renew it. You already God's aspect, but sometimes our thinking is behind, and God wants you to learn of him so that you can become all you're supposed to be. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what reasons? That you may prove. Meaning, you actually see it in reality. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? God wants you to find fulfillment. He does. He does. That's why we can rejoice. Now, will you let God have all of your life so he can make you the best you you can be? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a second?